All right, welcome to Newman Portal Symposium. Uh, this is the 1 p.m. presentation by uh, father and daughter team, uh, Ray and Steve Feller, an overview of a Holocaust money. Uh, Steve is a physicist at Coe College in Iowa, and Ray is the Dean of Student Support Services at MIT in Boston. And uh, their uh, a book is Silent Witnesses, uh, Civilian Camp Money of World War II, um, which is uh, available at your favorite numismatic bookseller. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Stephen Ray. Hello. Um, so we're, we're very happy to be here to talk about this topic, which is um, something that we have spent a lot of time um, researching and speaking about, and we appreciate um, people coming in order to hear about it. And we are hoping that there will be time for questions um, at the end, because we do think it's a very interesting topic and hope you will think so as well. Um, so um, briefly, we're going to talk a little bit about the tensions that led up to the war, World War II, um, because these play into this story. Um, so one of the first uh, issues, of course, was World War I um, and the um, depression that came after, uh, in particular, you know, Germany struggling with uh, money, with hyperinflation, um, looking for um, ways to come back um, after all of the costs um, that they had to pay uh, after losing in World War I, which led to um, a lot of enthusiasm for anti-Semitism. Um, Hitler was able to take advantage of the, the time and the desperation um, and then um, slowly to take over Europe. Um, in 1939, um, England and France um, said, you know, this is enough. And of course, in September, um, Germany, despite promises to the opposite, invaded Poland. And then um, over the course of the early 40s, Germany continued to take over most of Europe and Russia. So we're going to be talking in this um, discussion about money that was used in ghettos and camps. Um, so that story starts actually in 1933, pretty soon after Hitler um, took power, he um, started sending people to camps. At this time, it wasn't um, they weren't mainly for Jewish people, they were for political opponents of his, but it was an effort to contain people, to strike fear, um, and to you know, prevent people from speaking against him. Um, the ghettos, which we'll talk about as well, um, were different from the camps. Um, they were generally an area that would be part of a town that would be blocked off. The people who had lived there, who were not going to be part of that um, community would, would move out and there would be uh, very densely populated areas fenced in, um, but there would be places where people would actually live for some amount of time, usually with a lot of hunger um, and uh, bad work conditions and so on. Um, and then, of course, the worst camps that we he hear about and think about probably the most when we think about World War II, um, places like Auschwitz, um, happened mainly between 1940 and 1945. So, um, as you heard, our book is called Silent Witnesses, Civilian Camp Money. And we think that word witness is really important because this money, when you hold it in your hand, you're holding something that was actually there that can tell part of this story about what, what was happening, what it was like for the people. Um, and there was money used actually in every type of camp in World War II, not in every camp, but in every type of camp. And there were a lot of different reasons that it was used. Um, in the concentration camps, sometimes it was used as an incentive um, to get people to work harder. Um, there were some limited ways that people could spend the money um, you know, to get extra rations, to get materials to write home, um, soap, things like that. In the ghettos, it was used much more as a daily means of getting the things that you need, you know, food, coal, um, you know, trying to get material for clothing, things like that. Um, in the internment camps, which we'll talk about, um, 
it was used often for pay and for um, similarly for canteen purposes. Um, similarly in prisoner of war camps, although we won't talk about those as much today because we're focused more on civilian camps. Um, and then after the war, um, you know, when the war ended, there were many people who were far, far from their homes, who couldn't, who, who were too far to get home quickly or who didn't have homes to go back to anymore, or who didn't want to go back or who were afraid of going back to a place that would still be full of hate. And so after the war, even though the war ended, there were a lot of people needing somewhere to be and there were displaced persons camps for them, which also had money um, sort of to manage the, the um, daily needs there. And it's important to point out that camp money was used both by the Axis and the Allies, including in the United States. There, was, uh, there were camps and there was camp money that was used. So um, in particular, I know that there are probably questions about why, why would there be money for people in places like concentration camps? So one of the interesting things is that we actually have that answer from one of the first camps um, that there was, Oranienburg, and uh, the first camp to issue money uh, because the commandant actually wrote a book about the camp during the war. Um, so he explained that among the clever ways that they used it um, was to force out real money. So the same way that um, now if you were traveling from the United States to Europe, you would have to get euros, you would bring your money, you'd exchange it. Um, people coming into the camps would have to, would be told to give their local money in exchange for the camp money. So in effect, they'd be giving uh, the Nazis the cash that they had on them. Um, it was a way to control goods. Um, you know, it's sort of inevitable that people are gonna try to trade things, but if the um, camp leadership is in charge of the money, that means they have more say over who gets what. Um, there is a, a, an aspect where it could prevent escape. You know, if someone has, local money, it's a lot easier to escape and to be able to um, use it. If they were found outside the campgrounds with this camp money, that would obviously be a sign that they were not where they were supposed to be. Um, in many cases, there was a humiliation factor here. Um, you'll see some of the designs were um, purposely supposed to be, for example, very Jewish or um, you know, very clear about the Nazi um, power. Um, and there was some propaganda, which we'll go into more, but there were people outside of the camps who were curious about what was happening. The Red Cross, for example, and the money was a way to suggest, oh, we're just doing, we're doing things that are totally above board, totally normal. Look, we even have um, an economic system. We've even got money beautifully printed. You know, this, is, this isn't such a bad place. Um, so behind the notes, there are different people who were involved. Um, some were done in a standardized design. There were a few different standardized designs, but something along these lines um, where you can see the name of the camp. This one is from Buchenwald and the denomination. Um, and you know, you can see that, I mean, they're, they are not on extremely high quality papers. So you can see that there's some um, degrading on there, but um, sort of a standard professional looking design. And then others were sometimes designed by inmates. Um, in fact, in some of the ghettos and camps, there were graphic design departments. So here's an example that we'll go into more, but from that first camp, Oranienburg, a note that was designed by an inmate who was a political prisoner named Horst Willie Lippert. And you can see it's got a very powerful design of the, um, you can see the barbed wire fence and there's a guard there under the tree. Um, and here it also says um, Lagergeld, meaning camp money, not money for other purposes. All right, Dad, I don't remember when you're taking over, but right. I feel like I've been talking a long time, so maybe it's your turn. So we will talk about the uh, the kinds of monies used in the various places Ray just went over. So on the next slide, we see the camp at Iranianburg, which is the, uh, the first concentration camp. So Hitler came to power at the end of January 1933. And by the spring, concent uh, concentration camps were set up to get rid of the political opposition you know uh you wouldn't think this could happen in the u.s but uh, you know this could happen anywhere so this is near berlin they had uh, a few camps scattered around germany at that time and we'll go on to the next slide right so as ray mentioned horse willie lippert designed this particular money you can see his initials in the right 
toward the bottom on the right, you're already circling it now. That's his a, a signature. We have a statement there for the war about the money. And there you can see his initials L-I-P. Okay, next. Uh, there were three other uh, denominations with a common uh, back. So the 10 fennec, the 50 fennec, and the one mark notes. And these are fairly scarce. A set of these will set you back a couple of thousand dollars. Um, they're quite graphic. If we go to the next slide, we'll have a little story for you. Here's the 50 fennec note, and I'm going to take a look at one of the words, the concentration camp, concentration is lager. If you're very quick and see already, you can see that the G is not complete. And we've been discussing this over the last uh, few years. There's a close up of that. Uh, Horst himself, after the war, said he deliberately changed the note to get to change the G to a Y, hence the term slayer. Uh, this was written about as early as the early 80s. And we actually have seen images of notes in which the G changes from filled in to the Y uh, with the break on the top. So there's, a, I guess, an example of a little bit of resistance. Go ahead, Ray. Now at this uh, location near Berlin, there were two camps. One was the original camp at Oranienburg, and then just outside the town, a little bit later, around 36, they set up a mainline concentration camp called Sachsenhausen. Now, this is a very famous, and uh, maybe for you guys now, this is one of the more interesting stories you'll hear about the counterfeiting of British banknotes by concentration camp inmates. So the Germans, under a guy by the name of uh, Bernhard Kruger, got together the best printers, engravers, and people who could talk well, that is to say, who got themselves in, whether they were skilled or not, into an inner camp set up at Sachsenhausen, the famous Block 19 which had barbed wire around it within the concentration camp itself. And they set about to create nearly perfect British banknotes by the hundreds of millions, probably the largest counterfeiting scheme in world history. The notes were so good that they fooled the Bank of England in Switzerland. And eventually the British found out about it and recreated British pound notes by, and withdrew these from circulation. But they were still circulating in um, neutral countries or in other parts of the world, well after the war. It's very difficult to counterfeit this money. There are a lot of symbols and marks on them that, that are hard to duplicate. But there is a an Operation Bernhard five pound note that is a counterfeit. The counterfeits are easier to come by now than the originals. Uh, go ahead, Ray. From, uh, uh, Sachsenhausen, we're going to go into the main concentration camp period. I met the woman at Holocaust Museum, Houston, who actually wore these two notes on her blouse at the end of the war. That's a worldly position with, with these two notes. Um, I had her write about it. It's in our book, the description of how this came to be. The notes are quite graphic again. They're quite plain. The purpose was for extra work, basically, or a reward. Uh, out in command, I mean, outside work or field work. And you can see that this one has a an overprint for the workers' camp at Altenburg. And you can see Waffen SS KL Buchenwald in the work camp Altenburg. So this tells us about the organization of the concentration camps. You might say it does. Well, Buchenwald is not one camp. Here you can see that there's a, another camp associated with it called Altenburg. Actually, there are about 100 other camps, subcamps. And each of the mainline concentration camps you've heard of, Auschwitz, uh, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, Madhausen, all had subcamps. So there were thousands of camps scattered around Germany and in occupied Europe. So sometimes you hear people will, writing at that time saying they never knew about this, that the camps were invisible. Well, camps were not in downtown Munich, but in a suburb of Munich was Dachau, 
and with hundreds, thousands of camps, I have my doubts about it in general, if people knew about it or not. I have serious doubts. Okay, next slide. This is a three mark note from Buchenwald in terrible condition. Some of the, some, these do come in uncirculated condition as remainders after the war, but this one I got because of what's on the back of the note. I got to this German camp right after the US freed the people. They burned and buried people alive here. So that's already meaningful, uh, meaningful enough that this is an important note, actually. Next, Ray, moving along. Now, Auschwitz had money, too. Now, originally, Buchenwald was for, for uh, political prisoners as well, um, as was Auschwitz in 1940 when it was established. But pretty soon, Auschwitz became the main um, execution camp where killing became a machine and an industry. So why have money at Auschwitz? The answer is that while the killing was taking place, German factories now, German factories set up uh, businesses, factories, workhouses around the camp, employing the prisoners who had been selected to survive. And they worked and were given these premium notes. The Germans even had the rules and regulations promulgated from Berlin to all the concentration camps, and these have survived. So this is a one mark premium shine, premium note, for extra work or as a premium given as a reward from the concentration camp at Auschwitz. This particular design is the standardized 1944 one. So uh, the, the Germans actually printed these in Berlin. They, they had a department for the concentration camps. And each of these notes had a, a, an official printing number on them. It was a form number. But this was a big bureaucracy. Next to it. All right. I think it's time for Ray to jump in. Okay. Um, one thing that I would just want to note as we're, as we're speaking, um, for some of the places that we're talking about, there would be lots of people who may not have ever encountered the notes as opposed to some places where everyone would have encountered the notes. So Auschwitz is an example where um, we've heard, we have heard people talk about their experience receiving the notes and the, you know, the, what they were spent on and so on. And then other people who've said there was there, you know, I was in Auschwitz, there were no, there was no money. I was there. Um, and we, we, it is complicated because as my dad said, these are such big places that the experience of two people can be completely different. Um, so um, just to, just to point out that it's, it's, um, it's complicated to tell this story because it's so vast. But um, now we're going to talk briefly about um, Westerbork in Holland. Um, so Westerbork originally was um, a refugee camp as things were um, happening. There were people coming to Holland. There were also people, you know, trying to find somewhere to be safe. It's certainly reminiscent of the things that we know are happening right now and um, for the Ukrainian people, you know, trying to find somewhere to be, not knowing for sure where they can be safe. So this was actually originally a refugee camp for people to protect them that was then transformed into a transit camp by the Nazis when they um, came into the Netherlands. Um, these tracks are the tracks that would have um, taken people, quote unquote, to the east or to places like Auschwitz. Um, and after the war, um, they were bent upward toward heaven as a memorial. Um, so Westerbork is actually the camp where um, Anne Frank and her sister went um, as an example. And it was a very interesting place because there were, there, it was this, as a transit camp, it was this in-between space where people were waiting to find out Basically, when was their name going to be put on the list? There was a lot of fear about what it meant to have your name on the list. Where were you actually going? But people didn't know for sure. They weren't, they tried to hold out hope. They tried to protect their families. They tried to figure out what they could do while they were waiting. And an interesting thing that happened in this place, and that actually happened in, in a few places, is that the people came together and tried to find ways to keep their spirits up. Um, they had, among other things, a really active theater um, in the camp and would perform. And there were actually stories about the um, commandant of this transit camp changing the lists when there was somebody who performed beautifully 
um, and he didn't want them to be transported yet. Um, and there are also records of people very boldly um, performing songs and poems about their fear of being left and, uh, and about the um, goodbye to their friends and family. Um, so this note, which is from uh, Westerbork, was designed um, to sort of have an industrial look. Um, obviously, smokestacks are a, a very frightening image for a lot of people when you think about Auschwitz. This is actually the camp uh, laundromat. These notes were designed by a man named Werner Leuvenhardt. Um, and on the back um, was this gear. And the goal um, from the Nazi perspective was to say Jewish labor is essential for Germany's victory, that people should work. Uh, if, if the Germans could get the Jews to work, then that will help the German war effort. Um, the Jews, however, referred to this as life's last turn, and there was actually a lot of pressure not to work in Westerbork, and the, you know, it's better to sacrifice your own life and get put on the transit list than to contribute to um, the German um, success. So now we're going to talk about ghetto money, and I think, Dad, you're probably going to want to do LUDs because it's... And I'm going to move a little quicker. It's about 12.20 uh, right now, and I think we have just over 10 minutes. So this guy on this uh, Jewish stem from the ghetto Lietzmannstadt, which was the Polish town of, as my grandmother pronounced it, Wuj, or as we say, LUDs. Uh, that guy was Chaim Bunkowski, egomaniac put in charge of the ghetto by the Germans. He was a uh, Jewish failure before the war, but he became the absolute dictator of this ghetto for over 300,000 people. When the war ended, there were 887 people there. About 90% of them died at concentration camps like Auschwitz. By the spring of 1940, we had this official money, and this money was much used by the ghetto residents. It's very symbolic. Receipt for Kitung Uber, one mark, the eldest, the Juden in Lichtenstadt, M. Rumkowski, Chaim Mordechai Rumkowski. So this is money issued by the elder of the Jews, elder in the sense of being in charge of the Jewish self-government, which answered to the Germans, dated 15 May 1940, with a sea of, of, of stars of David, a star of, of David barbed wire enclosing the note. I mean, that's pretty symbolic. The back continues the, the symbolism, one mark, the seat, with a uh, Jewish menorah, the menorah used in the temple, the one that's in Rome on that uh, Arch of Titus. If you ever go to the Roman Forum, you'll see it. It was the one removed from the temple. Anyway, the bottom is a warning against counterfeiting, one of the more ironic statements on currency, I would say. This whole thing uh, was basically a counterfeit issue in the sense that it was money, but only used in the ghetto and can only buy very limited items. Okay, Ray, we're moving forward here. These became known as room keys after Rumkowski. And this I got from a survivor. And it's as meaningful to me as the choice uncirculated ones from before. Because this one was used. 10 marks. Go ahead, Ray. Now this ghetto, as far as we know, had the most kinds of monetary items of any place in Nazi Europe. Probably 500 to 1,000 different kinds of money within the ghetto, which was a few blocks wide and long in the city of Lutz. So here's uh, some soup money, some uh, meat money, flesh portion, um, more soup, gloves, socks, money for everything. Next slide, Ray. They're like, they are ration coupons. And every week the signs were posted as to what you could uh, buy money with the money and the coupons. You needed the coupons. So you see talent number 18, and um, and by the way, it's in German and in um, um, Polish, I believe. Next ray. They had coins, model death of the circulating German coins. So the one on the left is the ghetto 10 Fennec coin, which the Germans said cannot circulate. It looks too much like the German money, the 10 uh, Mar uh, Fennec uh, coin. By the way, this part of Germany was annexed. The western part, this part of Poland was annexed by Germany. And so they did use marks and Fennig there, the western third. And, that is, and, and also the metal changed to magnesium, which is a highly reactive metal, the alloy of uh, magnesium called electrum. 
not the gold uh, silver alloy from ancient uh, Greece, but a uh, an airplane metal actually. So the coin that you see there is actually a, a pretty good one by modern standards. Next. Second issue of coins, highly symbolic. I'm not going to dwell on it. Five, 10, and 20 marks. Next. Okay, now to raise your start, we're going to turn this one back over to Ray. Okay, so um, this was a camp that was in, um, the, in the former Czechoslovakia, um, not too far outside of Prague. And this was a very interesting place because this was where people were sent Initially, when Germ the Germans were worried that there would be certain people who would be missed, they were really trying to hide some of what they were doing. And so this was treated as a show camp. So people who were more famous would be sent there. People had some ability to write letters um, that to suggest that things were going well. Um, and as we mentioned before, this was one of the places that the Red Cross actually visited um, to see what was really happening. There were rumors that these camps were bad places and um, so they set up a full propaganda um, show, basically, where they had people, um, you know, they, they put in beautiful flowers, they had, they told people they had to act like they were being treated well, they set up shops, and they did a lot of things to make it look like a regular place to live. Um, and among the things they did was to issue money. So this was one of the places that had a graphic design department. And actually I should say this, this is a self-portrait of Peter Keene, who was one of the graphic designers who designed the notes. And you can see these are, these are very high quality notes. Um, they're very symbolic also. You can see Moses holding the 10 commandments um, on the front. You can see the star of David again. And just like in Luds, instead of just saying it's a hundred kroner, kronen, it says kvitung uber. So it's, they weren't supposed to be giving people money. So this is a receipt for money, but um, in theory could have been used like money. And this, this is the original image of Moses who was determined to be not grotesque enough to look quote unquote Jewish. And so they had to redesign him with curlier hair and um, a bigger nose and gnarled fingers. So this, you could probably tell what this is, but you might be surprised to see that it's here. But this is actually a Monopoly board that the children in this ghetto played with. Um, they, um, you know, a lot of times we refer to Monopoly money as money that's not very useful. Well, because this money system in this particular place really had very little use, they literally used it for Monopoly. They created this Monopoly board. It even has themed cards um, talking about ghetto life. And, um, the, and it was also a way that they helped the children in the ghetto learn about the geography of the ghetto and where different things were, where their families were. Um, and this survived actually because the children, if, if one kid who had it was put on the list, then they would give it to one of their friends and therefore the, the game actually survived. And there was um, here, there was some amount of, of life also. There was music, there was poetry, there were classes. There was a, um, a musical called Brundabar that was performed many, many times by the children. And the artists who were there, um, this is by um, uh, one of them, um, uh, I forget his first name, Britta Frita. Um, they, they tried to document, you know, they had to work and they had to do certain graphic design projects, but they also tried to use their art to document what was really happening and actually snuck some of their artwork out, um, to try to show people what was really happening there. Um, this is a coffee house, um, a, a ticket for a drink. Um, this is, um, one of, you know, these are sort of, this was more used than the actual money. Um, these are like ration cards um, for different goods. And this is actually a stamp that was made um, by the same group of graphic designers to show this idyllic place. To, and there was actually, they were actually given out as souvenir cards to the Red Cross when they visited and were, it would seem quite fooled by what was happening. Um, so now we're gonna talk a bit about internment camps, Dad, how fast can you go? Uh, all right. so. We're basically done now with the uh, Nazi Germany part, but there were camps on the Allied side. The Isle of Man and the Irish Sea had 10 World War II camps. And I visited that uh, site with a co-college student. We went into the camp sites, which still exist for the most part as bed and breakfast today, because the Isle of Man is a vacation spot for UK uh, people. 
although the Isle of Man is very proud to say that they're not part of the UK, they are a British Crown dependency instead, an independent uh, country within the uh, British Isles. So that is a, uh, ahead, Ray. that's a uh, one um, shilling note. Uh, this shows where the Isle of Man was in the middle of the Irish Sea. Keep going, Ray. Good place to uh, keep people if you did, didn't want them to get away. Now, what people? These were Germans, German citizens caught in England when the war broke out, either refugees or Nazi businessmen or officials. This is one of the camp sites, the palace camp in World War II. I, I walked by it uh, with my students. This is uh, from, um, <laughs> of all places, uh, eBay, an original camp wallet. Now, when I saw that, I knew that had to be pretty good. It had four camp notes within it, including this half penny note. One, two, three, four notes, you can see them. The one half penny is the only one known to have survived. The one penny is also rare. These are very rare notes. So that was for the palace camp. Eventually they went to a standardized issue of civilian internment camp money. These are British civilian internment camp money. And this is a handmade wallet on the Isle of Man. Now, we keep going. This guy, by the way, became an ice cream tycoon in England after the war. They had coins at one of the camps, that Anken, which is just outside the capital of Douglas. That's their symbol. That's not a swastika. That's the Triskelis. And the basic motto is they land on their feet no matter how they're tossed. It actually comes from the Romans. Um, Camp Hay in Australia. Uh, I don't know how much time we can push this envelope. Maybe another three minutes. Can we do that? Are we allowed to push three more minutes? Let's try, Ray. Yeah, you can go as long as you want. <laughs> oh, as long as we want. We have about 10 to 15 minutes more. Yeah, go for it. All right, thank you, Len. Let's go, Ray. This is one of the more interesting stories anyway, guys. Go, Ray. All right, so um, this, uh, similar to the group of people in the Isle of Man, there were people who had been living in England who had of, were of German descent um, it wasn't the best organized effort to round people up. There were people who had been in England for a very long time, and there were a lot of people who were, in fact, Jewish. But among the places that they were sent, including the Isle of Man, including Canada, was also Australia. So there was a whole ship of people sent um, under, uh, unfortunately, pretty terrible conditions. The people running the boat, the British soldiers, thought they were Nazis and treated them as such, even though most of them were um, refugees themselves. Um, this is from a movie about Camp Hay with Bob Hoskins. But the note from the notes from this camp are my favorite notes from anywhere ever. They are so interesting. Um, and the, the people in this camp were truly bored. They were in the middle of nowhere in Australia. They wanted to be contributing to the war effort. They weren't allowed to. And there were artists, there were professors, they had held classes, they did all kinds of things. And this man named George Telcher, who had actually helped design Austrian currency before the war, um, designed these fantastic notes. Um, so there are a bunch of things that are symbolic, and I'm going to point out a few of them. Um, so one is in, so you can see around the edge, there's barbed wire, um, you know, to symbolize that they were, um, you know, in, a, in this sort of prison environment. And there's actually writing in it. If you can see where my mouse is, this is upside down, or maybe it's easier up here, sorry, here. A W up here in cursive. We are here because we are here. Because we are here. And it just goes around and around. That was actually their camp anthem sung to the tune of Auld Lang Syne because they really felt like they had no idea why they were there. Um, it's hard to see on here, but the the name of their ship, the HMS Denera, is back here with the dates. Um, this um, this is the bank manager, and then here these were just any random person who happened to be around when they were signing the notes got to sign the notes. Um, they have serial numbers that match to the number of each of the prisoners, so that each prisoner could have their own special souvenir with their special number. And in the wool of the ram here is the name Eppenstein, who was the elected um, head of the camp. And on the back, 
Um, each of the rams is, is um, branded with the number seven because this was part of Camp 7. Um, Camp Hay actually had multiple um, sites. And there are names hidden in all of the wool. And each of the rams um, is lined up to be um, symbolic of the different barracks um, that were there. It's just a fantastic note. Um, and I, I love the cleverness. Mama, I like oh, it too. It's funny. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the United States and then we will be able to do questions. Do you wanna do um, yeah. Crystal City, Dad, and I'll do the Japanese, the other okay. Japanese. Okay. So we just have a few examples of this. By the way, uh, uh, Camp 7 has very interesting money, as uh, Ray said, but Camp 8, as interesting, if, and it, it, it's unbelievable. We just don't have time to go with Camp 8 now. So the U.S. did have uh, civilian internment camps because uh, there were German citizens, Japanese citizens, Italian citizens in the United States. Note how I'm phrasing it. Japanese citizens. Ray is going to speak about Japanese Americans in turn. You've probably heard of that famous case, a sad case. And uh, that one has a constitutional question. This one, in war, enemy aliens are detained. Uh, you already saw that in the, uh, on the Isle of Man. And there were many other places. So in the United States, the main um, civilian internment camps were scattered around the country, with the largest one at Crystal City, Texas, famous for spinach, hardly anything else. So we went there a few years ago to uh, Crystal City. The foundations and some concrete and some artifacts are still there, uh, now owned by the city of Crystal City. And, and uh, they built schools on this land, and right next to the schools are the remains of the internment camp that had room for 3,500 people. They had money, as you can see. The top image from a heritage auction of the $5, very rare uh, plastic um, coin. And then on the bottom is the more general Department of Justice Attorney Canteen Immigration and Naturalization Service for other camps. You might say, what other camps? Well, these are again scattered around the country. One of the most famous ones was, and ironically enough, Ellis Island in New York Harbor, became a civilian internment camp in World War II. Okay, next, Ray. So Ray and I went there. Th these are the remains. So this is, so behind our school buildings and this big concrete slab is uh, the remains of the swimming pool. Now, th the swimming pool was interesting. It was gigantic. And there were separate sections for the Japanese internees and the German internees. This, uh, this house both. They had their own bathhouses. They had their own uh, uh, food uh, distribution areas. Sometimes they traded among themselves, but really uh, they kept separate. They had different likes and dislikes. They were different people. Next, Ray. So it turns out that we were not the first to visit this site. And Justice for All, the first National Historic Reunion at the swimming pool, World War II internment camp, 1942 to 47. There was a reunion held in 2002 by the internees. United We Stand. That was a water tank, by the way, in the war. All right, go ahead, Ray. All right, just a few slides left. This is just meant to be an overview of an enormous topic. Go ahead. You could tell we were, we were very enthusiastic about it because it, it, it just tells such interesting stories. And you know, we could probably, or we, in fact, I think have given an entire talk just on Crystal City, um, which my dad was just talking about. Um, but these are some examples. So this is actually an area where we're very hopeful to get more information. Um, we're actually hoping to do some traveling now that um, hopefully things with COVID will be a little bit calmer to do some traveling. Um, in the United States around where the Japanese camps were. But you know, there was a lot of fear that came after Pearl Harbor especially. And Japanese people and sometimes people of Asian descent in general were rounded up and were placed initially in assembly centers, mostly on the West Coast. 
um, while you know the government kind of tried to scramble together to figure out what to do. Um, we have, there is information about people who grew up in these places. As my dad said, there were people who were citizens, people who were born in the United States who were in these places. Um, their treatment was, it was certainly not like the death camps of the Nazis, but it wasn't good. You know, people losing their homes, losing their businesses, people being placed in tiny, you know, single rooms for entire families or sometimes multiple families with only, um, you know, blankets separating them. Uh, people having to share, um, you know, uh, lavatories and things that were not clean, not good. And um, some of the stories, you know, people kind of, uh, I think, use some humor about it now, but also the just the food tastes were so different. And some of the people running these camps thinking, oh, they like rice and not knowing how to cook rice or not knowing, you know, not understanding the tastes of, of the people who were there. Um, but we know that there was some money in these sites. Um, we've got records of how much people were paid. There are incredible records actually that were kept. Um, and so we're very curious. We have a few examples of things that we've seen. We also know that there were a lot of co-ops that were run within, the, within these sites, um, which allowed the people in the camps to have more control over what goods they were bringing in and so on. So this is an example of a, of a coupon book um, from, this is the Wartime Civil Control Administration Center store. And you can see that on the back is the name of the person who owned the coupon book. It's a very similar style to prisoner of war um, chits that, um, that we've seen where in, on the inside there would be a book of coupons um, like this and you would keep them attached until you spent them and then you would cut them off and hand them in and that was how um, you would pay for things. So you would have to keep the book intact and probably the reason this one survived is because it did have that one ticket left. Um, but there will be more to come. We have some interesting things that we have found, We've got some movie tickets um, and, and more to tell about this story. Um, this is the book that was referenced before where there's more about um, all of this. And I think that brings us approximately a little bit late to on time. Okay, Lynn, so that, that is a briefest of brief overviews of, of this uh, topic. Okay, all right, we'll uh, open it up for uh, Q&A. Um, you can enter them uh, into the Q&A uh, via the- one uh, has come in, I believe. Let's see what we have The, the bottom of the screen. Um, there was a two series of metal tokens issued and used at camps for nationals as a, of access countries here in New Zealand. Ah, uh, I have seen tokens. I, I'll comment in a second. The second series is also used in Australia, so they're included in catalogs for both countries. I was just gonna mention, I have some of the Australian tokens. We simply didn't put everything in. Um, but thank you for that comment, Martin. Uh, M. Souza, thank you, wish, wish it was longer. Well, well, we'll be speaking more about this topic. We promise you that. Oh, and he has the book. Thank you very much for having the book. I myself no longer have extra copies. I believe Len got the last, uh, available copy that I had anyway. I'm not sure if Ray has any copies of the book, maybe not. I might have one, but it's, um, but it's, we've got a, but it's a secondary bookmark at some place. So thank you, M. Sousa. Is it, uh, um, I'll, I'll also say if, if this is a topic that is interesting for people, first of all, we, we love to speak about this. We think it's really important and we're happy if there are spaces where you would like to hear more detail about one particular piece or, or something where we're very, willing to to share. We're happy to answer questions now. Um, and we also participate in some events across the country, sometimes the world, um, talking about these topics. So if you're interested, there are other people you can also talk to and, and you're very welcome to join. There's lots of research to be done. It's a fascinating um, set of topics. Mommy, you definitely have that book. <laughs> okay. That was Leonardo. So Eric Hodge now says, no question. He liked it. Thank you very much, Eric. And then we have uh, M. Sousa uh, saying he created a PowerPoint on this subject for his coin club. And some of the images came from your book. If you send uh, Ray or me an email, Ray, can you put your email address in there maybe? We can send you better images than taking them from the book. I thank you for doing that. But we have you know, the original images and we would be pleased to share them with you. Uh, you mentioned a, a book event at the uh, summer A&A convention this year. Um, 
is there another edition coming out? Okay. Uh, well, so those are two, two points. The first point is easier to answer than the second point. On, on the first point, there will be an entire book on Operation Bernhardt, which we just scratched mm -hmm. the surface. We have very interesting um, information on the Operation Bernhard notes. They also counterfeited other objects we didn't discuss in the presentation. So the book should be out for the first time, actually, at the ANA in Chicago in August. On the second point, the second edition of the book is actually more than halfway done and will be twice as large as that first edition. When it comes out, if I had to guess now, if Ray is able to push me uh, sufficiently uh, and I can push her sufficiently, I would guesstimate uh, a year and a half to two years. We have a lot of extra information now uh, since the first edition came out. So um, that's a good question, Len. I wish I could give you a better answer, but it's around that time period. Um, another question, um, of course, there's a very significant collection of, of, of this material in the uh, Holocaust Museum in Houston. I, I'm curious if uh, any European museums have formed uh, significant collections of uh, Holocaust money. I can take that one also. Maybe Ray, maybe can also. So uh, in terms of Europe, there are museums that, that, that have some uh, examples of the money and they're scattered. Um, uh, for example, in Denmark, there is a resistance museum. So Denmark is a very special case well, every country is a special case when it comes right down to it. Denmark was very heroic and saved most of its Jewish population by shipping them over by boat to Sweden. Um, a couple of hundred were rounded up out of the thousands. Thousands were saved, hundreds were rounded up and sent to Theresienstadt, where the uh, uh, Danish government kept close contact as to how they were doing. And so therefore, a lot of them survived. Danish government was heroic. There are only two really heroic governments, of which Denmark was one, Bulgaria was the other. Um, so at this resistance museum, there are many examples of the um, Theresienstadt that notes that were, that were used, as well as notes uh, from some of uh, the other campsites. So they are scattered. The museum in Houston, um, upon which we base a lot of the images in our book, that was formed by a marvelous collector named Charlton Meyer passed away about 20 years ago now. And he deeded his uh, collection to the museum on the condition that they would exhibit it and use it, and they have. And um, so for example, uh, we had an opening of the um, Charles Meyer uh, a collection exhibit uh, about a year after he passed away. And uh, I got to scan the entire collection and it's a quite extensive collection. He originally approached the Holocaust Museum in Washington, but they would not assure him that they would exhibit it, yeah. as is true of most artifacts. So they were honest, I guess, with them. 95% of the artifacts known that were given to the museum in Washington are not exhibited, over 95%. Yeah. Okay, next question. Oh, I see another one is coming through here. Yeah. So what, oh, go ahead, Ray, you want to answer? Well, I, oh, sorry, so answer the next one if you want. You well, you can you can do the um, translation or the um, so I can I can say that the we have records of how much people were paid and it did vary it varied by place and it also varied by job there were jobs where um, you could get paid more depending on you know similar to pay scales in companies here so if you were sort of a doing a entry level kind of um, labor versus if you were had a little bit more responsibility um, with the limit and I would guess that it didn't reach this limit very often of 10 marks a week um, but plenty of people paid things like 50 fennings um, things like that but I am not as um, good at the numbers and inflation so I don't know what would the what would the equivalent be in dollars Dan? So in those days a mark was about a quarter at 25 cents so uh, not much money and uh, of course, in the concentration camps, people were not paid well. There was a whole story, and this is a good question. I should mention who this is from. This is from Lewis. Uh, thank you, Lewis. Um, the United States and Germany were signatories to the, the Geneva Accord, which went to uh, 
various uh, versions. The one used in World War II is from 1929, which specified who had to work and the pay. And so, for example, if you were not an officer, you were required to work if you were POW now. Um, in the United States, we paid POWs 10 cents an hour. And they were given chits, they had bank accounts, and they were given U.S. government checks at the end of the war, which still exists today, by the way. People collect those as well. As Len probably knows, people collect everything when it comes to numismatic. Um, on the Isle of Man, they, they, they housed both POWs and civilian internees. So it was, a, uh, again, a complicated question, but Britain was also a signatory to the uh, Geneva Accord. Now, having said all that, don't think for a moment that the uh, relationship between Russia or the Soviet Union back then and Germany followed the Geneva Accords. They did not. And so it's a uh, really a complicated story that has been studied to, to some extent. We have another question that just came in from Peter Jones. Thank you, Peter. Where would you buy food in concentration camps? And was 10 marks enough to prevent starvation? I'll give it a shot then, Ray. So <laughs> this, of course, is a complicated question, too. The premiums in, in the hardcore concentration camps were not designed to keep you alive in terms of calories. Uh, the calorie intake was below starvation level in any of them. Um, 10 marks was a lot of money in the camp. Uh, you know, the notes were typically 50 fennegs or, or one mark. So 10 marks was a bit of money. Another example of money, Peter, which is perhaps uh, more well known is the use of cigarettes as money, both in the concentration camps, as well as in the, uh, deep, uh, the DP camps after the war. We haven't gone over the DP money just because of time, but that's a whole other story. Generally, there were camps run by the Allies, which also uh, paid uh, in script, and, uh, and that depended which zone of occupation you were in, by the way. All right, so uh, Peter, we didn't uh, do much justice to your question. I mean, we know that uh, there, there were things that you could buy in canteens, depending again on where you were and who you were. Um, you know, there are people who, the, the Jews in the camps were treated worse than the political prisoners, for instance. Um, so there were things, you know, one, among the things you could buy were um, sort of margarine, things like that, that could maybe give you a little bit of a boost, but not, not much that you could really buy. Interestingly, a whole other story um, that, the Jews were not able to access, but there were also um, brothels in some of the concentration camps, which is another way to use the money um, and is a whole other complicated story. Um, the question about counterfeits, yes, there are definitely counterfeits of camp money, um, in particular because a lot of the, um, a lot of things were made crudely um, or made with stamps um, and things. So it's, unfortunately, it is easy for people to try and if you you know if you're ever on eBay or something and you see something that looks like oh here's a German note but it's stamped it's a you know German note with a stamp on it that says it's for a camp or something like that that would not be um, real but you know you can see the these kinds of issues that were made specifically for camps they're not German money with a stamp on it it's a it's a special uh, kind of money that's made. But yes, unfortunately, there, there are um, counterfeits uh, that you have to be careful of. Yeah, there are laser printing examples also of modern counterfeits designed to fool collectors as well. Um, the counterfeit and actually, uh, since it was alluded to before, but be, there was also counterfeiting during the war, including in the Luds ghetto, there was counterfeiting of the notes in Luds. Um, there was... Um, that they, they actually had security markings kind of, you know, like our, like US money has um, on those notes. And there was, there was a, an almost successful counterfeiting. Unfortunately, the person who came up with the counterfeit released the counterfeit before the actual note came out. So it was um, found pretty quickly. Um, the details of that are in a book called The Chronicle of the Lutz Ghetto. They, this uh, Romkowski, the dictator there, controlled everything, including uh, the central government archives division. So every day the records were kept. They were found at the end of the war, translated into English by Yale University. So we have a complete account of the trial, what happened to them and so on. We also have the conversion, if you would, of the money, the value of the money 
in that camp. So the Lodz Ghetto was a camp. It was not a hardcore concentration camp, but it was a place where people died nevertheless. It was a, more like a transit camp than, than anything else. And the, um, the value of the Lodz Ghetto money in terms of bread, potatoes, is duly recorded on a day-by-day -day basis. So you can see the inflation growing very easily in, in those official records. In fact, they're quite moving. You know, you read in there of deportations, which means people sent to the death camps, at the same time that they're talking about the price of uh, potatoes. You know, it, you know it, the people lived in some cases three years in that ghetto. Okay. Um, by the way, M. Souza, what is your first name, if I could ask? I mean, I, I've been saying M. Souza, but we're getting to know each other a little bit here. And uh, feel free, uh, I'm Steve, we have Ray here, we have Len here. Uh, and thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we know what the M stands for. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mike. And again, if you want, I reiterate what Ray said. Uh, we have our emails in here. If you want to uh, contact us about any aspect of this, feel free, and we'll try to answer you. Um, so I know we're reaching now. We're reaching the hard end. That at, at some point, Len, I don't know. I'm willing to keep going, but if people have more questions, ah, something else. I will definitely do so. Thank you, uh, Mike. I want to get back to this point that uh, Peter raised. Um, you had this uh, tremendously poignant story in your book uh, from Viktor Frankl. He talks about uh, digging a tunnel and, and being rewarded with a bonus, um, which he traded for cigarettes, which he could trade for soup, which he called a respite from starvation. So maybe he was a little less hungry that day. Um, but, uh, you know, as you, as you pointed out, they were still all on starvation diets. I think to survive... You have to be very resourceful, play some games and tricks, maybe uh, in some cases having to work with a god, um, do things that uh, are unspeakable. Um, some people did survive, of course. At, at a place like Auschwitz, though, most did not. And a lot, a lot of luck, a lot of, you know, you happen to be you happen to be, you know, the, we actually, one of the stories that's been really interesting in um, researching for Operation Bernhard um, was uh, we found a, a story of a survivor from Operation Bernhard who had basically, his, his brother had been put on the list knowing that the next day they, he, his brother was going to be transported out of, or he was going, sorry, he was going to be sent to the gas chamber. And so um, there was this, you know, person who had come who turned out to be Bernhard Kruger, who was in charge of Operation Bernhard, who came because he was looking for people to bring into this, you know, he wanted people who knew about paper, people who knew about printing, people who knew, you know, engineering, all these things. And so this guy, Chaim Hollander, wanted to save his brother. And so he just sort of pushed to the front of the line and they said, what do you need? We can do it. You know, and there was just the luck of that day. The day that he needed someone to be there, someone was there looking for um, people that they could pretend to be expert enough that they got they got to be part of this group, and it saved. You know, he and his brother both survived the war, but that's entirely luck. If his brother had been on the list a week later, that opportunity might not have or would not have been there. So there there are a lot of stories about um, sort of right place, right time, and unfortunately, most people were in the wrong place um, because most of the places and times were wrong. I'll say one more thing about that story. So they donated, the, the children of Chaim are alive. We've spoken to them recently, actually. And uh, they donated their father's artifacts, including some camp money. And not only that, but they donated uh, a note we hadn't even seen before from um, Sessionhausen. So that'll be in the new book, by the way. All right, we have uh, Eric and Ron, Steve. The L has a bar across it, and as I found on a trip to Poland in 2014, that symbol is pronounced as a W, correct. So your grandmother had the correct pronunciation when she said Woods. Well, yes, uh, and thank you for that, uh, Eric and Ron. Um, I heard her say it, so, and she was from a little uh, town called Putabitz, right outside of Lodz. She came Woods, as she said, and as, as you correctly point out, Eric and Ron. Um, she came in 1907 with her sister, but the rest of the family went to the Lodz ghetto and all but one died. So the death rate was high, just in my little anecdotal case here. The one who survived came to Brooklyn. 
set up a dry cleaning business, and about 10 years later was shot and killed in a um, robbery in Coney Island. Mm-hmm. A little irony there, I guess. But all right. Ah. Um, this is Mike, a good question Mike, for Mike. Mike, question. Yes. We've heard this a few times. Mike, thank you for asking again. You mentioned a new book. What is the name of the book, and when will it be printed? It will be something like uh, Silent Witnesses. Oh, no, I think he's talking about the Operation oh, Bird oh, book, uh, which so which we actually, question. yeah, the, there's a there's a um, a poll going around from all the con- for all the contributors to the book to decide what the title is going to be. So we don't know 100. Um, percent Presumably, it will be decided soon because I think it's supposed to be printed this month. Oh. So um, some That's combination. Some combination of words involving Operation Bernhard, possibly involving forging a history, forging a something. Um, yes, it is being edited by Joe Bowling. It's being put out by the Spungen Family Foundation. Um, and we've, we have written one of the chapters for the book. And it's going to be released in August with, I would guess, a big pomp and circumstance. Yeah, I'm sure that's at ANA. Who are the uh, okay. co-authors on that book? Um, there are a lot of authors on the. Oh, okay. a lot of, right. there, there are a lot of authors on it. Um, the overall editor is Kiel. Uh, what's his last name? Juski, something like that. He works for Danny, uh, Danny's foundation, so he's the editor. Okay. Uh, the children of Bernhard Kruger wrote a chapter. If you can believe this. Oh, wonderful. The. Um, uh, yeah, the Saxon has a museum. Len Malkin wrote one of the original books on Operation Bernhardt, so he has a chapter in there. Ken Lawrence has a chapter in there. He's a noted uh, philatelist. Well, there were a few anyway. I've seen the list. I have a draft copy of the book, but I can't open it. Oh, and moment. Joe Bowling has a, ch- a chapter also on counterfeiting. Yeah. On, yeah. on counterfeiting, as you might imagine. Yeah. And Joe is actually the technical editor, the numismatic editor of the book. And uh, I, I tell you this, I don't know of a better technical letter than Joe. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. I mean, Joe spent hundreds of hours editing this book with wonderful questions. Let me give you an example of the level of detail. Just one example of our book, which went through uh, quite a bit of editing. Um, there's a, in, in the German language, there's an umlaut, of, you know, those little dots that appear to it would change the pronunciation. So he noticed that in one word, we use the umlaut, and then another word that that should have an umlaut, we use the ae. So, pages later, he realized that we were inconsistent with the umlaut, and about three pages later, we use the ae. So we had to go back to the original source to find out which one was the correct one. We found it. That's the level of detail. Yeah. <laughs> I like that actually. <laughs> My God, only Joe could do that. Yep. All That's right. Great. One last question, guys. Uh, you got us in the groove now. Anyone else out there? I'll just give them a second here because we got quite a few comments. I, I appreciate the comments. I'm sure Ray does too. What, uh, uh, what are the best uh, sources for collecting this sort of material? Is it just wherever you can find it? Uh, there are auctions. I think auctions are probably one of the best. There are a few dealers who specialize in it. Bill Rosenblum in uh, Colorado, for example. So, you know, in the old days, it'd be NASCAR had some auctions and uh, and such. Heritage every so often has a piece or two. Um, and and ta- I mean, talking about it, it's interesting the this. number of the number of things that we have because of speaking about this and survivors or children of survivors, you know, coming up and saying. I have this thing that I've, you know, I didn't know anyone would want it or, um, and then my dad is the, is, is an incredible eBay um, treasure hunter of, you know, finding, because, because when people have these things in their families, they don't necessarily put the keywords that we would put. And so you have to kind of, you know, think differently. Um, they're, they're, um, and then, you know, it's great to go to shows, of course, now, hopefully more and more will be able to happen in real life again, but to be able to see things and talk to people I'll and, and have know. someone know that you're looking for things so that they can have sort of lots of eyes looking for similar. Um, I'll mention a vest pocket dealer, Dave Frank, who is a very good guy. He is disposing slowly the stock of uh, David Seeley. 
and he's on eBay, MPC1 buyer, I think it says, MPC1 is his uh, name. He's quite reliable and quite honest, and know, but he knows the prices, what they should be, and so on. So I won't say they're bargains, but they're, they're fair. They're, what, they're the real thing at a real price. Yeah. I'll give one story maybe about the, the eBay. Well, one was that wallet I showed the, uh, uh, the image of. Um, there were a few other bidders, but nobody's serious, so I got that at a pretty good price. There was one other lot. I mean, there have been several of these things that come up every so often. One was a series of notes from Swiss camps. So Switzerland was neutral in World War II. Uh, so we didn't show the images of it, uh, but it had camps. It interned German, American, and British flyers, for example, that whose airplanes fell in Switzerland. So they went to camps. So they, uh, one of the British camps had money. Very rare. Probably no more than that I know of a dozen notes. Could be a few more. Oh, the famous David is there. Mm. Well, David, I think uh, yeah, I, I, I hopefully I promoted you fairly. You are honest. You're a good guy, but you'll pay the real price. I think that's fair. But thank you, David. Mm. Uh, so there was the Swiss uh, three notes. Now, you have to be careful when using eBay. There's a lot of counterfeits, a lot of uh, photocopies, a lot of junk. Uh, so to the novice, I would not recommend either. But MPC1 buyer, I would recommend because they have the real stuff. Um, nevertheless, uh, there was this uh, lot and uh, Len, it, the starting price was a nickel mm -hmm. for the three notes. I could tell they were real. I could. And uh, a few of those were not. Oh, one MPC buyer. Thank you, Dave. He's given, and that's a good source. Dave, uh, why don't I invite you to put your email address in there so people can just contact you because he has good stuff. Okay. So uh, it started a nickel. And uh, I'm watching the auction. Luckily, it was, no keywords would, would match with the collector community. I think, he, I think he put the name of the Swiss camp or, or he said something like, uh, you know, Swiss um, grip or something like that, where most people won't search for that. And uh, when the uh, auction ended, Leonard, and others here, it was uh, sold for five cents. Oh, my. Wow. Three, three treasures must have come from an estate. Uh-huh. And um, then I had a problem. I knew they were real. I didn't want him to send it by slow mail across the ocean. He was in Europe. So should I tell him to uh, send a certified registered mail to me, you know, which would cost far. <laughs> I finally decided that was the best thing. <laughs> send it to me as a, in a secure manner. Uh -huh. I'll pay extra. Yeah. So I paid yeah. like $20 at a nickel. <laughs> Whatever it was. And they came and they were the real thing. Luckily, I knew a collector who would appreciate it. So we had a uh, transaction and that was the end. So things can be found. But for every one of those stories, I'm sure there are a hundred fakes or more. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Okay. I think that's uh, thank it. Thank you for coming, everybody. All right. Uh, video of this session will be available in two to three weeks. And uh, attend the ANA. There will be a book signing event for the Operation Bernhard book. And uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for attending.